Good morning, and welcome to Seeing Jenkins Memorial Presbyterian Church. We are so excited to have you with us here today. You're in for an amazing treat with Reverend Dr. Patrick Damon. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment to our YouTube channel, and we hope that you enjoy today's message. Church, whatever else is happening here on this mountain of transfiguration, it is the divinity of Christ shining through his humanity. When we talk about Christ theologically, we often describe him in terms of the incarnation or the indwelling of Christ in human flesh. From the Gospel of John chapter 1, we read that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. What that means is that in the one person of Christ, he is both all man and all God. That he is the only God man, and that's who Jesus is. And then John says in the same chapter that we beheld his glory. Now understand that we does not imply that everybody beheld his glory. Uh, in fact, that we was very small at the time that John said it because a lot of people missed out on Christ's glory because of his humanity. The, that word glory literally means weight. It means significance. It, it speaks of importance. And because of his humanity, many got distracted from his divinity. And so they missed out on his glory. They, they missed out on the significance and the importance of Jesus. They, they missed the weight of his glory because of their focus on his humanity. It does not mean he didn't have the glory. It means they missed the glory because of where they focused his humanity. Because when you deal with the humanity of Jesus, his humanity literally means that he looked just like the rest of us. There was nothing that was so special in his physical nature that made him different from you and me. Even in Isaiah chapter 53, most of us know that part where it says he was wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of his peace was upon us, and, and by his stripes we are healed. But, but before you get that far, the prophet asks, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Isaiah is saying, we have reported to you about the Christ, the anointed one, and what he's going to do, but who believes it? The implication is a lot of people haven't believed it. And why have they not believed it? I'm still in Isaiah chapter 3, 53, verse 2. It says, because he was like a root out of dry ground. And that in the physical and in the natural, there wasn't much to him, nothing significant about him. He was like a root out of dry ground. Matter of fact, he goes on to say that there was nothing comely. That's the King James Version. Nothing comely or attractive about him physically that we should appreciate him. <laughs> He looked like everybody else. When, when Herod got ready to kill the one that was born, the king of the Jews, the Bible says he didn't just go and kill Jesus. He killed all the little Hebrew boys two years and under trying to get to Jesus. Why did he do it? Because all the babies looked just alike. There was nothing in the physical or in the natural that caused him to stand out. Even when Jesus was walking through Jerusalem and Palestine, he looked just like his disciples. They were all eating the same fish sandwiches, drinking water out of the same cup. And after eating just like us, he got 
the itis. Y'all know what the itis is. Yeah, yeah, he got sleepy and, and, and responded just like any human would. Where is Jesus? He sleep on the back of the boat. <laughs> he, he had to eat. He had to drink. He had to sleep. He was just like everybody else. Even when those soldiers went to arrest Jesus in the garden, they didn't even know which one he was. That's why the Bible says that Judas betrayed him with a kiss. Why did he do that? He did it to point him out. They didn't know which one he was. So Judas said, the one I kiss, that's him. Mm -hmm. Because in the natural, in the physical, in his humanity, he looked like everybody else. Even when Jesus died on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. If they knew who I was, they wouldn't be doing this to me. Their perception was messed up because they were so focused on his humanity that they missed out on his deity. Because even today, we still judge a book by its cover. Even today, people will look at you and, and based on how you look, come to uh, conclusions about you. And, and here you have sincerity and you have integrity and you have the manifestation of the glory of God. The, the Bible even talks about God's glory on us and Christ's glory in us. So you can have all that and folk can still miss it. Why is that? Because they're looking at your frailties. They're looking at your shortcomings. They're looking at your mistakes. They're looking at your past failures because we still judge a book by its cover. You know, recently I had to buy a new hard cover for my laptop. I used my laptop all day, every day, and, and my cover was starting to get beat up from all of the wear and tear of using my laptop all the time. I mean, it was bad. It was scratched. It, it was cracked. The cover kept falling off, and, and I was at home using it, and, and my cover was falling off, and my wife, Antonia, looked at me and said, you need to get a new cover for your computer. That thing was really bothering her. I, I didn't know it was bothering her like that, but it was really bothering her. And un, until she said that, I didn't know how bad my cover really was. I mean, I got all my sermons in there. I got my Bibles in there and my study software is in there. Everything, my whole life is in that computer. And, and, and the cover wasn't really bothering me because I really didn't focus on the cover. I'm more concerned with the content. But folk who don't know the content will make judgments based on the cover. Y'all don't hear me today. Uh, Y'all hear what I'm trying to say? You, you can be as sincere as you want to be. You can be wholly filled with God's spirit. But folk will still look at your cover, look at your frailties, look at your shortcomings, and make judgments based on your cover. But the Bible says that God has taken his treasure and placed it in earthen vessels and in, in clay jars. So yes, I might be broken. Yes, there's some aspects of me that's messed up. Yes, there might be some things about me that's jacked up, but that don't mean I don't have God's Holy Spirit on the inside. Do I have a witness in here? That's what happened with Jesus. Folk missed his divinity focusing on on his humanity. So now in the text, Jesus goes up on this mountain and he's transfigured. Break it down, preacher. In a real sense, there's a metamorphosis that takes place. Uh, Jesus starts shining. Uh, his, his clothes start shining. And thank God that he began to shine because, you know, we do live in some dark times, do we not? Uh, we live in times of war and countries invading other countries with no cause. And, and every now and again, you need Jesus to show up and shine in the midst of darkness. 
Uh, and what is really happening here is that even though folk have been looking at his humanity and missing his divinity, now on the mountain of transfiguration, his divinity shines through his humanity. Uh, but everybody didn't see it. Peter, James, and John were the only ones with him. The other nine disciples were at the foot of the mountain. What Peter, James, and John got was a pre-resurrection glimpse of a post-resurrection Christ. Talk, boy. Uh, they, they got a preview of what Christ is going to be like after the resurrection. Mm. He even told them on the way down the mountain, don't you tell nobody what you've seen until after the resurrection. So up until the resurrection, no one saw him the, that way except for Peter, James, and John. They got a glimpse of his glory. There it is. Uh, before everybody else got a chance to see it. Everybody didn't see his shine. Just Peter, James, and John. And, and here's what we can learn from that, that when people don't see you, uh, when they don't appreciate your sincerity, they don't appreciate your integrity, when they don't appreciate the glory that God has given you, you don't have to sit on the sideline and do nothing. Now, when they didn't see it in Jesus, he was still shining. Now, and on this mountain, now, Jesus is shining when only a few people are looking. I wish y'all would hear me today because I know some of us, we will shine, but we can only shine, Ron, before a crowd. Uh, that's what some people do, right? I, I know some preachers, preachers who won't even preach unless you have a certain number of people there. They even send you a form, fill out this form and, and answer the questions on the form and, and tell Tell us how big is your facility? How many people are you expecting? Because if it doesn't meet their standard in terms of numbers, they won't show up because they can only shine in a crowd. I know some gospel singers that won't sing in front of a few people, but if it's a crowd, they'll sing. But, but what they don't understand is that you're not singing for the people or preaching for the people. You're singing to them and you're preaching to them but not for them. Uh, you are preaching and singing for God. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's five, if it's 50, or if it's 5,000. Uh, I wish I had some secure saints in the building or in the chat uh, who will say I can shine even when nobody is looking. Uh, not only is he shining, but get this, he's serving even when folk don't recognize his shine. They missed his glory, but it didn't keep him from serving. That's why some folk in church don't serve right now. I know that doesn't happen here at the C.N. Jenkins Memorial Presbyterian Church. But some folk won't serve unless they are out front serving. Mm -hmm. uh, they can't serve in the background. They have to be out front. I know that doesn't happen here, but, but Jesus is serving even when folk don't realize his glory. And not only that, his suffering did not keep him from shining. Back in chapter 8, he says, I'm going to be delivered into the hands of sinful men and crucified. He, he's talking about his suffering for you and for me. But even in his suffering, it did not prevent him from shining. And I'm preaching to somebody right now who used to be involved in ministry, who used to serve, who used to shine. And you ask them, well, what's going on? Well, well I'm really going going through right now. I, I, I'm, I'm really up against it right now. I, I'm, I'm going through some pain right now. Y'all, that's not the time to sit on the sideline. Even in his suffering, he still did his shining. He's showing us how to operate even when folk don't recognize who you are. 
And, and, and watch this. Even though they didn't see it until they got on top of the mountain, y'all, Jesus had already been shining. Just because folk didn't see it, it doesn't mean he wasn't shining. We act like his shine didn't come until he was on the mountain or his shine didn't come until he was raised from the dead. Y'all, he's God. He's from everlasting to everlasting. Jesus was there before the beginning, and, and since he's always been there, he's always God. Therefore, he's always shining. His glory had already been there. They just didn't see it. Okay, let me try to help you with this. I see some of y'all not getting it. Um, uh, the S-U-N always shines. There ain't no such thing as a sunrise or a sunset. Uh, you hear people talking about, well, what time is sunrise? Never. What time is sunset? The sun never sets. Uh, ain't no such thing as a sunrise or a sunset. Y'all, the sun don't move. The sun doesn't rise and the sun doesn't set. It's the earth that rotates. It's not the sun moving. So, so even when you don't see it shining, uh, it doesn't mean it ain't shining. Uh, it just means you don't see it uh, because the earth rotates over a 24-hour period. Uh, so when it's dark over here at 8 p.m. in Charlotte, uh, it's still light over in Africa. Uh, the sun is still shining. It's just that the position we have placed ourselves in the rotation uh, has caused us to miss the shine uh, because of where we're positioned. Uh, here's what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, it's not that Jesus is not shining. Uh, it's just that folk are out of position to see him shine. Woo, Jesus. Okay, let, 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 let me prove it to you. Let me prove it to you. Y'all still not getting it. There are 12 disciples. Nine of them are at the foot of the mountain. Three are at the top. So nine of them didn't even see it. They were disciples. They were connected to Christ, as it were. But they still didn't see him shine. Why? Because of where they are positioned. So when folk didn't see what you see, and you ain't got a trip, they just ain't where you are. Preach, Patrick Damon. I'm doing the best that I can. Because once you get to a certain level, you start seeing stuff they don't see, hearing stuff they don't hear, experiencing stuff stuff they haven't experienced. Do I have a witness in this place uh, who sing some stuff uh, others could not see uh, because God brought you uh, to another level. But not only is his divinity shining through his humanity, what is also revealed is an identity that comes from sovereignty. Oh, this is my beloved son. Jesus is on the mountain and he's transfigured. There's a metamorphosis that takes place. And then the voice of God speaks and God says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. And I know why y'all not saying amen, because you don't understand the rumors that were circulating when Jesus was born. Uh, y'all didn't hear the gospel, the gospel did you? Uh, uh, see, see, Jesus' mother was a virgin, a, a young teenage girl that got overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. And that which was conceived in her was of the Holy Spirit. It was the Son of God. She had to go and tell her people that I'm pregnant and that the baby is God's. Well, wasn't nobody believing that. Uh, her own man didn't even believe it. Joe, Joe said, listen, you pregnant. We ain't did nothing. We hadn't gotten busy. So I know the baby ain't mine. You had to have been messing around on me. And an angel had to come and convince him that it was really God's son in her womb. So rumors began to circulate, and it got to the point uh, where they began to call Jesus an illegitimate child. In fact, those rumors followed him 
for 30 years. The Bible says that when Jesus went back to Nazareth as an adult, that's where he was raised. He was born in Bethlehem, spent time in Egypt, black Africa, and then came back and was raised in Nazareth. So, so when he goes back to Nazareth as an adult, a 30-year-old starting his ministry, he was performing miracles, and they started looking at him saying, isn't that Mary's son? Y'all, that's their way of calling him illegitimate. Because at that time, they did not identify children by their mothers. They identified their children by their fathers. Sons of David. Sons of Abraham. Sons of Zebedee. They didn't identify anybody by their mama among the Jewish people in the first century. So for them to say, isn't that the son of Mary? That's their way of saying that's an illegitimate child. They're still spreading rumors after all this time. And let me pause here in my message just to say there's no such thing as an illegitimate child. Be because what did, what did the baby do to become illegitimate? I mean, th was there some kind of prenatal sin to make the baby illegit? No, there are no illegitimate babies. Now, there are some illegitimate parents, but ain't no illegitimate babies. Y'all ain't helping me preach today. Uh, so, so his community says he was illegitimate. Even his brothers and sisters, his siblings said he was silly to think that he was the Christ. He, his enemies called him Beelzebub and, and Satan. But when God spoke on the mountain of transfiguration, God said, let me clear all of this up. Uh, y'all been talking this mess for 30 plus years. Let me help y'all understand something. He's not an illegitimate son. He's not silly to think that he's the Christ. He is not not Satan. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. No wonder Jesus could handle his business in the midst of being called outside of his name because it doesn't matter what other folk think about you when you know who you are. I wish I had some help with this because folk will call you outside of your name but you ain't got a trip on that if you know who you are. They can call you the N-word, call you the B-word, call you the H-word, but you ain't got a trip on what they say. Folk, look at me talking about Patrick Damon, think he's something. I, I sure do think I'm something. I, I'm a child of the king. That's why I walk like a child of the king. I talk like a child of the king. I dress like a child of the king. I act like a child of the king. Is there anybody in here who knows you're a child of the king. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And y'all, I finally understand why some of us won't listen to him because you don't believe he's the son of God. Because if you believe that Jesus was the son of God, you will listen to him. You, you will listen to him as he speaks through the word of God. You, you, you will listen to him as he talks. Why? Because he's the son of God. And when other people start offering counseling and advice to you, if it doesn't line up with what he says, oh, no, I got to kick that to the curb. Why? Because it doesn't line up with his word and what he says. That's why I know some of us don't believe he's the son of God. Because if you believed he was the son of God, then you would only listen to the stuff that lines up with what the son is saying. That's why on the mountain of transfiguration, Moses showed up on the mountain. Elijah showed up on the mountain. And the Bible says Moses, Elijah, and Jesus started kicking it on the mountain. 
They're, they're, they're conversing because there's no contradiction with Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And Moses is there because he represents the law. When God gave the law, the Ten Commandments, he gave it through Moses. He gave it the Ten Commandments. Elijah's up there. Y'all know Elijah. You can read about him starting in 1 Kings chapter 17. He a bad brother. He's a, a major prophet. And then there's Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God. There's no contradiction here between Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. There's concord. Uh, Jesus said, I came not to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill it. And you hear people talking about, well, I'm a New Testament Christian. The Old Testament don't mean nothing to you. It meant something to Jesus. Even to the point that Moses showed up with Jesus on the mountain. Right? Because Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it. It's, it's not a contradiction. Jesus said, the law says, thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you, don't let your anger get out of control. Because if you let your anger get out of control, you will kill. The law says, bring the tithe and the offering. Now, Jesus says, bring whatever it takes. Uh, the law says, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, don't even look at somebody like you want to sleep with them. Uh, because you've already committed adultery in your heart. He doesn't contradict what it says. He fulfills what it says because the law lines up with Jesus. So listen to him. And then there's the prophet Elijah. You, you see, we live in the 21st century and you got to be careful because folk will talk about they prophesying just to manipulate you. Because even when you prophesy, it still got to line up with God's word. I've heard preachers up preaching out of the Bible, I guess. And then after a certain point, they stop and say, I'm prophesying now. Um, they, they announce it. I'm, I'm prophesying now. Well, well, my question is, what were you doing the last 30 minutes you were up there? And, and, and here's the thing. Here's the thing. When, when some of them, not all of them, but some of them say, I'm prophesying now, what that means is I don't have to use the Bible now. I'm prophesying. God is speaking directly to me like the prophets of old, and I am speaking it to you. And God can speak directly to you and me. His Holy Spirit speaks and teaches. He can speak directly to us, but after he speaks, if it don't line up with the word, that wasn't God doing the talking. So you're not prophesying, you prophet lying, because God ain't going to contradict what he's already said. Somebody ought to help me preach this. But, 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 but watch this. When Moses shows up on that mountain, that is proof that when you have faith in the plan of God, when you're dead, you're not done. Oh, Patrick Damon, you preaching better than they saying amen. Uh, because in the Old Testament, it says that before they went into the promised land, that Moses died. Well, Moses is dead. Why is he meeting with Jesus at a higher level? That's because when you're in the plan of God by faith, when you're dead, you're not done. And that's my word to somebody whose mother died, whose father died, granddaddy died, big mama died, your son died, your daughter died. Baby, if they had faith in God and the plan of salvation, it may look dead to us, but they ain't done. They meet Jesus at a higher level. Do I have a witness in here? Uh, then, then a cloud comes representing the presence of God and envelops Peter, James, and John. And whenever you get close to the manifestation of the glory of God in Christ, you can't help but be affected by his glory. 
And the only ones that the cloud did not overshadow were the ones that were not close to Jesus. So if you really want Christ and his glory to have an effect on you, it's not when you sit back and do nothing, but it is by faith when you continue to try to get closer and closer to him. Because when you get close to Jesus, you can't help but be impacted by his glory. Oh, y'all missing this. Uh, uh, not long ago, I was in my office at church, and, and I walked in, and somebody was in the office working on a computer, and she needed uh, some help getting Internet access because she couldn't get onto the network in order to get onto the Internet. For some reason, the network was down that day. So I asked her, do you have an iPhone? She said, yeah, I have an iPhone. I said, well, here's the thing. You don't need to get on our Wi-Fi network to get an internet connection. You can get access to the internet through your iPhone because your iPhone has a hotspot. And she started looking at me crazy because she didn't know what I was talking about. So I explained to her that a hotspot basically gives you access to the internet and you have one on your iPhone. And you can you can do this anywhere as long as your computer is close to your phone. Because if you're not close to the hotspot, you can't get access. So to demonstrate, I, I took her phone and turned on her computer and gave her access to the internet. She had access and activation because she was close to the hotspot. Some of y'all got it, some of you didn't. Uh, he, here's, here's what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, Christ is the hot spot, mm -hmm. but you cannot access what you need when you're distant from him. Uh, but when you get close to him, uh, you can access power, access anointing, access healing, access deliverance. Ac is there anybody in here uh, who knows that when you get near Christ, he turns you on, uh, he activates you. Wait a minute. Last thing and I'm finished. When you talk about glory, it is activity in glory. Glory ain't just shining on a mountain. Glory is action in the valley. Okay, here it is. Uh, uh, Jesus is shining on the mountain. And Peter says to Jesus, listen, Jesus, let's just build three shelters. Hang out here. We're finished. This is good. We'll build one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and we'll just stay right here. And Mark, who wrote this, said that's because Peter didn't know what to say. P Peter's just like us. We, we don't know what to do with glory. We think glory uh, is a means to get stuff. That I need glory so I can build a shelter. I can build a house. I need glory so that I can get a car. I need glory so that I can get the money. And all that's cool. But you think God gave us the manifestation of his glory just to upgrade your SUV? Because all of us know at least one person who experienced glory and messed it up. And, and here's the thing. You're not going to know what to do with the glory until you get filled with the Holy Spirit. Ah. Uh. On the, on the way down the mountain, Jesus told Peter, James, and John, don't even talk about this until after the resurrection. Why? Because the Holy Spirit will not come until after the resurrection. And you can't deal with glory without the Holy Spirit. But once Jesus died on the cross and got raised from the dead, and Peter got filled with the Spirit, he wasn't talking about building houses. He was preaching the gospel 
gospel of Jesus Christ uh, and souls got saved. Uh, now he knows what to do with the glory. Uh, Jesus is showing us glory in action. Uh, it ain't just shining on a mountaintop. Uh, it's coming down from the mountain uh, and being a blessing to folk who didn't experience the glory. Uh, you can't keep waiting on folk to come up to your level to get the glory. Uh, you got to take the glory down to where they are. Uh, Jesus gets to the foot of the mountain. Uh, nine of his disciples are arguing with some people. Uh, and Jesus says to them, what are y'all arguing about? Uh, and the father comes forth and says, my son is filled with an evil spirit. Him, he's doing self-destructive things. He's throwing himself in the fire, throwing himself in water, throwing himself to the ground. He's self destructive uh, and I brought him to your disciples uh, and they couldn't do anything with him uh, so you got parents uh, arguing with disciples uh, you got disciples uh, arguing with the scribes and the teachers of the law uh, everybody is arguing about what to do with young self-destructive people uh, all the experts are on it uh, everybody's arguing uh, and the father said your disciples uh, couldn't do anything and in the midst of all that arguing, Jesus says, well, bring them to me. And Jesus cast the demon out of the boy. And now the boy began to operate properly. But what you see, y'all, is glory in action. You didn't see glory sitting on the mountain shining. You see glory coming down, helping young people find their way. Are y'all hearing me today? That's the glory. And then the disciples said, Jesus, how did you do that? We tried it, but we couldn't do it. Jesus said, this kind can only come through fasting and prayer. See, some of y'all don't know the power you have access to. And as we enter this week into the season of Lent, God is leading somebody into a time of fasting and prayer so that you can understand the power that you're working with. Because when you fast and pray, when you draw near to God, baby, you receive power to speak to demons and they gotta move. You receive power to change young folk lives. You receive power to make a difference. Do I have a witness in this place? It's glory in action. John chapter 17 verse 4. Jesus says, Father, I brought glory to you on earth because I completed your work. Not because I shined on a mountain, but I did your work. Y'all, some of us, we sitting up here boasting and bragging about glory glory and ain't doing nothing. It needs to be glory in action because Jesus was not at his best when he was between Moses and Elijah. He was at his best when he was doing something to save folks lives because he was at his best when he was between two thieves on Mount Calvary. Y'all ain't getting this thing. It's not when he's on a mountain shining but it's when he's on a mountain suffering for those that need Need to be saved. It's glory in action. Let me close this message because it talks about how the cloud came down and overshadowed Peter, James, and John. I love that. Now we're talking about the Shekinah glory. That's the glory of the Old Testament. When the children of Israel got released from bondage and a cloud led them by day and a cloud led them by night and a cloud got between them and their enemies so that the enemies couldn't mess with them. Y'all, that's the Shekinah glory. That's the cloud of God's presence. Y'all still not getting this. Everything you need, it's in that cloud. Y'all, I told you I use my laptop every day. I got sermons and manuscripts and outlines. I got illustrations, Bibles, commentaries, documents. I got everything on that computer. And for about two years, I did a silly thing. I went without ever backing up what's on my computer. Now, what if somebody had stolen it? What if I had lost it? What if it breaks down two years 
surplus of work down the drain because I never backed it up. Uh, so I needed to figure out how to back up what was on my computer. And I discovered that there's a feature you can use when you have an Apple product called iCloud. And all the information that's on my computer, I can move it and back it up on the iCloud. Now I can see the I can't see the iCloud, but everything I need access to can be put there in the cloud. So now when I want to receive it and I want to get it, everything I need is in that cloud. And I can get it from my iPad, I can get it from my iPhone, I can get it from my laptop. As long as I got the right device, it doesn't matter where I am. I'm in Charlotte right now, but it doesn't matter because everything I need is in that cloud. And as long as I got the right device, I can access whatever's in the cloud. Y'all, that's what the shiny kind of glory is all about. God's presence. And if God is in there, then whatever you need is in that cloud. I know you can't see the cloud, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But once you get the right device, that's your faith. You can access whatever's in the cloud. There's joy in the cloud. There's peace in the cloud. There's deliverance in the cloud. There's healing in the cloud. There's joy in the cloud. Is there anybody here that knows if you got faith, you can get whatever you need. Wherever you are, won't God show up and make a way out of no way? Somebody shout, that's the glory. That's the glory. That's the glory. Have you seen the glory? Is there anybody in here who can thank God for a glimpse of his? Wow. Welcome back. What an amazing message this morning. Wow. Yes, it was. Hopefully you all enjoyed it. Hey, if you would like to be involved in CN Jenkins, make sure you visit our website. There's plenty of opportunity for you to connect with somebody and join our ministry. Also, if you would like to give, you can use Giveify and there are many other ways to give. You can even bring it on down to the church if you would like to. If you'd like to follow us on social media, make sure you do that. All the information is on the website. And last but not least, make sure if you haven't, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. We hope you had a great day. Enjoy. We'll see you next time.